This is the Jabberjaw Podcast Network. Visit JabberjawMedia.com for more shows like this one. Here it is. We're on. Join us here each week, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, right here on Adobe Radio. Welcome to the Mike Herrera Hour. Hey, everybody. Going to be a great episode for you. Um, We have a sponsor, Blue Apron. If you guys didn't already check it out, I implore you, check this company out. It's great. It delivers to your door. I've been using it. We we were just natural customers because we love smaller companies. We love um, locally and organically grown pr- produce. And uh, we don't like factory farming if we can help it. I mean, I'm not a crusader. I'm just, I just like quality ingredients in the food I eat. And Blue Apron is a huge part of that. But it doesn't taste like crap. That's the thing is it actually is good, really good dishes. So uh, thank you, Blue Apron, for sponsoring. Make sure you go to blueapron.com slash Mike H. You'll get three meals completely free, free shipping. They ship it to you in a box that has like this ice sort of packing around it. And it keeps the food fresh while it comes to you. And then you stick it into your fridge and then you prepare your meals so uh it's pretty rad it's it's, uh it's pretty good it's pretty good so don't wait and in thing is is blue apron is a company that knows that when you cook with incredible ingredients you get incredible meals so uh they're setting that high bar that high standard for quality and uh they take great pride in finding you know, the best suppliers, artisanal suppliers, family-run farms, fisheries, ranchers. Um, could be that Japanese ramen noodle shit. I don't know. What are you going to do? Jake, how you doing? I'm doing good. I'm daydreaming about food and meals that are being prepared. I, I admitted last week, it's not me. <laughs> it's not me making the, the... I'm just benefiting from eating the meals. So... And somebody has to do that. So, you know, you're there to help out in the eating. Department. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, whether or not you cook all the time, this will make it way easier because all the ingredients come to you and it's the perfect, uh, the perfect, you know, measurements and it comes in little baggies. So if it's a tiny little thing or, or if it's like a clove of garlic, it'll just come to you in a little baggie. It's, it's rad. Um, new recipes created each week by Blue Apron's culinary team. You know, it's not repeated ever. They always have something new. So if you don't like something, you just don't get it delivered. You say, no, I don't, you just unclick the box and um, you just go on their website or they have an app as well. I didn't even know they had an app. My wife's like, yeah, I always just go on the app and choose the meals I want and choose the meals I don't want, whatever. Super easy. Um, You can customize that. You can get, I think it's just three meals is probably about perfect if you get three meals a week um, or... If you get even three meals every couple of weeks, whatever, you know, it's your pace. So if you're not like cooking all the time, maybe you just want, you want it every couple of weeks or every month or something. I don't know. It's up to you guys. That's, that's what's cool about this. There's no pressure on that. Um, but it just comes straight to your door and, um, yeah. So, you know, you check out this week's menu. You're going to get three free meals, free shipping, um, BlueApron.com slash Mike H. So B L U E A P R O N dot com dot C O M slash forward slash Mike H. So M I K E H. Please use that. Use that code. You get free stuff. But I guarantee you, if you if you care about food and you care about ingredients and your body feeling good, you won't regret this. Um, the prices are awesome. You go out and spend ten dollars on a a person to eat, that's not going to happen. Not at all. You're going to, you know, tax, tip, drinks. Oh, yeah. Way over that. Way over that. Even if you're cheap, cheap, cheap. stuff is not nearly as good. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. And don't you hate it when when, uh, when you you spend money on something and then you're just kind of bummed about it? Hmm. Like you literally, like you, you already bought it. And you're already bummed. I think Jerry Seinfeld had a bit about that where people just get like buyer's remorse before the meal comes. And it happens a lot with food. Honestly, if I go out and get food and it's not good, 
I immediately had that like, uh, I should have just stayed home and made it myself, you know? Yeah. I love it. So, you know, I was saying last week, this is a personal thing for me. It's definitely, um, I'm, I'm excited to, to have them as a sponsor. And hopefully if you guys buy a few of these or sign up or whatever it is, maybe they'll keep sponsoring, keep doing it. Cause I want more and more people to be eating good quality products, good meals, learning how to cook. I'm going to do, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to challenge myself to cook one of these meals. I'm going to do it myself instead of see how idiot proof it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I'll, (laughs) I'll Snapchat the whole thing. Yes. I'll periscope it, whatever it is. We'll do it. So blueapron.com forward slash Mike H please three free meals plus free shipping. How can you go wrong? You could be like, okay, well, I'm not going to get it for like two weeks, two months, even if you're out of town or if you're just doing something else, you know, you can just put it on hold. It's awesome. I'm going to go on that app too. check out the app. Everything's moving to mobile. Mm -hmm. All right. So thank you to blueapron.com. That's it. Let's move on. This episode is brought to you by Loot Crate. Loot Crate. What is Loot Crate? Well, I think a lot of you listening to this show are going to be into this. I know, I know you guys well, and uh, this sounds like it could be right up a lot of y'all's alley. Loot Crate is a monthly subscription box service for epic geek and gamer items and pop culture gear. So, what I imagine is like you don't have a ton of time to like search for everything uh, that you're into online because you got work and family and whatever school, all this. Well, for less than $20 a month, you can get four to eight items that include licensed gear, apparel, collectibles, unique one of a kind items and more. Make sure to head over to Loot Crate. That's L-O-O-T-C-R-A-T-E.com. LootCrate.com slash Mike. Just Mike. No H on this one. The other ones may be different, but this one, remember, it's just Mike. Enter code Mike to save $3 on any new subscription. Okay, so remember that. It's just Mike. LootCrate.com forward slash Mike. Um, you know, MXPX should do something like this. That it, it sounds like a great idea. I love this. So uh, head on over. Just check out all the things they got. There's like different, tons of different sort of like genres of fandom, I guess you could say. Like, uh, so Loot Crate is more than just a subscription service. It's an entire community of fans that share their experience and interact with each other around the unboxing of each month's crate. Okay, okay, I get it. So you don't know what's going to come, and people get really excited about the fact that they don't know. So they guarantee $40 plus dollars in value in every crate. Sometimes it's a lot more. So think about that. Less than $20 plus the, you save $3 on any new subscription if you use my code lootcrate.com forward slash Mike. And you're going to get more than $40 of fun stuff. Things that are always different every month um, as a different theme. All items are curated around that theme. Previous crates. Okay, so for an example, so you can get an idea of what they've done. Um They've done uh, items from franchises like Star Wars, Marvel, The Walking Dead, The Legend of Zelda, and many more. So if you're into the gaming aspect of it, um, just join us uh, as as we celebrate the futuristic. We've packed July's crate with items from some of the pop culture's favorite prognostications prognostications of science and the future. I should have read this before. Uh, So look uh, look towards tomorrow with items from Rick and Morty, Futurama, Star Trek, Mega Man, Valiant Comics, and Star Trek, including a model, a figure. And don't forget our monthly tea and pin so this month it's futuristic that's the theme you're gonna get a lot of futuristic shows pop culture stuff i love futurama i love star trek awesome um so remember you have until the 19th that's july 19th at 9 p.m pacific to subscribe and receive that month's crate and when the cutoff happens that's it it's over so go to lootcrate.com forward slash Mike and enter code Mike to save $3 on your new subscription today. Thanks guys.
So my guest tonight is Ryan Holiday. He's a strategist and writer. He dropped out of college at 19 to apprentice under Robert Greene, the author of 48 Laws of Power and Mastery and many other good books. Uh, later, Ryan served as director of marketing for American Apparel. His company, Brass Check, has advised clients like Google, may have heard of those guys, Taser, Complex, as well as many prominent best-selling authors. So Ryan has written four previous books, including The Obstacle is the Way. It's been translated into 17 languages, has a cult following among NFL coaches, world-class athletes, TV personalities, political leaders, and others around the world. So Ryan lives on a small ranch outside of Austin, Texas. Austin, one of, one of America's best cities. Um, his latest book is Ego is the Enemy. We'll get into that. We'll get into all his other books and what they all mean. And it's a continuation, definitely, of where we left off. He was on the show back in December 2015, episode number 136. I highly recommend you guys check that out. He starts out by interviewing me for research for this book, Ego is the Enemy, that is finally out. Finally, I mean, it was like a year later and the thing came out. He, Ryan works really fast or he works really hard. One of, you know, maybe it's both. So we're going to continue this conversation. I want to get into it a little bit more. Uh, but yeah, episode number 136, if you want to listen to what we did the first time. Um, so without further ado, here's my interview with Ryan. Let's do it. All right. Well, thank you for coming back on the show, Ryan. Appreciate it as always. Ryan Holiday, everybody, say hi. Hey. Uh, no, this is an honor. This is an honor for me. I don't think um, like twelve-year-old Ryan would have believed that this was happening, but I'm very, I'm very excited. Twelve, twelve-year-old Ryan wouldn't believe a lot of things that are happening to you. I think. Sure, I would say what he would say. What's a podcast? And then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. I can't I can't believe you're talking to the to the guy from MXPX. That would be the next thing. And then it'd be like, what? You're an author? What? You did this, this, yeah, this, this? Yeah, all these things, of course. So I want to get into it, but I think let's start with why stoicism. Uh, it's, I mean, one, it's just fascinating and I find that it works, but it, it's... Um, let's stoicism. explain it a little bit more sure. to, to for sure. everybody that's like, huh? <laughs> so, so Stoicism is is an ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, and I I know that even in saying that people people's eyes are glazing over, they're trying to think about something else. But it's not philosophy as you would think it, right? It's not uh, what you learned in the classroom. It's a philosophy, primarily it, known as a practical philosophy. So it was used uh, the, the sort of prominent Stoics. You have Marcus Aurelius. You have Seneca, you have Epictetus. These were people who did who did things, right? Uh, the the founder of Stoicism, his name was Zeno. He was a a, a very successful merchant. So it was a it was a it was philosophy when philosophy was essentially designed to be self help. It was it was um, philosophy in the sort of um, uh, th that helped people with the what they would call the art of living, and so. Um, this philosophy has been popular now for thousands of years with with people who who do things, and I, I was introduced to it very young, and uh, when I was in college, and I, I was just blown away by it, and I I've, I've sort of studied it, and I find that it is t Tim Ferriss, who's the author of the Four Hour Work Week, and an investor in Uber and Twitter and Facebook, he, he sort of defines it as an operating system for life, and so that that's how I see it as well. I like that. Oh, that's something that people can understand. Definitely. Yeah. I've it's not, it, it's not like, Hey, this is, you know, this is some esoteric explanation of the universe. It's not metaphysics. It's how do I deal with my temper? You know, what is the meaning of life? You know, um, uh, should I be afraid of dying? Um, why <laughs> should I be, a, why should I be a good person? You know, that these are, these are the questions that, you know, religion answered for millions of people over the last 2000 years, but um, philosophy also has answers. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we, we had a conversation back in December, and this is yeah. uh, definitely, 
I want to go further into where we left off there. You were doing okay. research for your book, Ego is the Enemy, correct? No, I was doing research for another book that's going to come out in March or April. That's more. I, I also I have a marketing company, and I uh, I work with a lot of brands and um and 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 authors and businesses. And so, what we were talking about was how you make something that lasts. And 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 you know, I think MXPX is a band that's been around for two and a half decades. Is certainly one of those things. Um, and, although I would argue that. Um, to be to to be able to pass on short term success and short term bio- validation requires mastering the ego. So I think they're related, but we were talking about a different thing. Okay, okay. I I must apologize to my audience. I think I I did an intro where I mentioned that we did, you know, you were doing research and interviewing me. I thought it was for that book, Ego is the Enemy. But it kind of makes sense though because it's all intertwined. And and when I was. Yeah. Well, I've been uh, thank you by the way for for uh, your books. They're great, uh, Ryan's. I would say I started with the smallest one. You sent me some books. <laughs> thank you. So, Growth Hacker Marketing was right when I was sort of doing a bunch of marketing stuff for the Hollywood shows. For uh, if you if you remember, people that are listening, I'm constantly talking about you know the latest event that MXPX is sort of part of and. Really, I was getting a lot of my ideas, and I have a hunger for knowledge, uh, in in a way that I can relate to. And I feel like you're definitely one of those authors that's in my wheelhouse. You understand a lot of things other than just academics. But I've never been, I've never been an academic type person. So it's connecting those dots. See, and I would think that you were, you know, being an author, of course, but. Uh, <laughs> the the idea there is is having something very simple very easy to understand for people like me you know in my age bracket it's great yeah. so people people that are interested in other band people musicians listening to this growth hacker marketing is a great little little book on what what has changed if you haven't been paying attention out there just check that out but let's get back to ego is the enemy um you were talking a little bit about the new book that you're you're writing, yeah. I didn't realize. Sorry that, that that was a whole different book, man. You were just you were I'm busy. busy. I, I was blown away, and it makes a little more sense that you were doing the research for a book that came out a year later. I was like, man, no. that, that man is fast. No, I'm 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 always jealous and impressed with how quickly musicians can turn things around. I was dealing with this one um, hip hop artist and. Uh, his his album was out in like two weeks and it wasn't done and I was just like blown away. Um, but but <laughs> with with books like this book has been uh, more or less done. The the one that just came out like about a week and a half ago. It, it's been done for you know six or seven months. It just takes a long. You have to print them. Then there's advanced copies and all this stuff. But it, to go back to what you're saying about a- academia, I, I've not. I, I dropped out of college. I have no sort of formal training in any of this stuff. But what's so amazing about Stoicism is it's not really designed for that, right? It's um, uh, it, it's a total sort of redefinition of what philosophy and thinking is. Epictetus, who's one of the Stoics, he says he basically says you become a philosopher when you begin to question your own thoughts, and that's really all that it is. It's when you can stop taking the world around you for granted and and start to think a little bit more deeply. That's that's what philosophy is. Um, to me, at least, and to the Stoics, and so it, you don't—you do not have to be a genius. You do not have to be a, a Harvard divinity grad to be able to to parse through these, you know, uh, difficult things. They're very straightforward and very obvious, and they they make your life better. I think immediately. I agree absolutely. I've been into it for a while, and I'm still I'm still working on it. Like you're saying. <laughs> keeping yourself in check, keeping your, your, not only ego, but your emotions and your, your anger. You know, I feel like a child sometimes, you know, when you get mad and then you later on, you cool off and you feel silly that you were so mad over something so, so stupid. Um, even if it isn't stupid, you just feel like I can't control myself. And, uh, and it's funny that, that we see, it's not funny. I guess it's 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 obvious that we see religion as as a way to, I don't know, have a system of living, have a way of life. And I was always taught. I grew up in the church. Full disclaimer yeah. there, uh, Christian church, 
in case people were wondering. But I, I always, I always thought to myself, if you don't, you know, have have a spiritual relationship with God, then you obviously have no morality. Because why would you? There's no point in it. Let's just go fucking do whatever we want. Once I realized, no, we each individually as people have free will to do what's right and. Oh, it, it's kind of nice when you're nice to people and they're nice to you. Like that's really like it doesn't. You don't need God to tell you that. You, that well, the, that's yeah. you're born innate within you. Yeah, I think at its at its core, and I realize it's a simplification. Yeah, Christianity basically says, "Don't do these bad things, or you will go to hell." Um, that that's that's the that's the carrot or that's the stick, and the 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 carrot is hey. If you don't do these things and you, um, you know, accept Jesus into your life, you will go to heaven. And so that that's why you're supposed to follow these precepts, essentially. Um, Stoicism, and, and I think most of the philosophers, you know, going Aristotle and Epicurus, they're basically saying, hey, um, being bad is bad. It, it, like doing bad things uh, eats at your own soul and it makes you miser miserable. They're, they're basically saying doing uh doing evil um being ill-disciplined you know indulging in every temptation being angry they're saying that these things they degrade you and you you are the one that suffers from that in addition to the rest of the world suffering it so it's there's i think they're they're trying to make a logical case for for being and living well which uh, as a uh, sort of you know, as a rational person, I, I'm very attracted to that. And it, there's an argument that Christianity absorbed a lot of Stoic ethics. And so you can be as a, a Stoic and be Christian. And there's plenty of, of for most of human history, uh, you know, after the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, Empire, that's what Stoics were. Or you can be an atheist and you could be Stoic. And, and what, what matters is what you, what you actually do, like what choices you make, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. I, I, you know, going back to my, I didn't realize we were going to get too far into that, but it, it all makes sense because we all live with, with religion. We all live, you know, we're all, most of us from America, I assume people listening to this mm -hmm. podcast, but even if you're not, you're familiar with it. So it's just weird that we have to dance around talking about religion sometimes, but it's all intertwined into our history, into our societies and it's nice to get a little bit of context where stoicism fits into that and it's actually predates that it's man going, yeah. well, I'm not sure, you know, there's whether or not you believe in this God, this God, this God, back in those days, there was thousands of gods, right? Um, beyond that, just, this is a good formula, a good system for life. Um, yeah. And a, f a fun, a fun fact, Seneca, who's probably the, maybe the second most famous stoic was alive when Jesus was crucified. Um, so they, they overlap in a very weird way that people don't necessarily understand. Yeah. See I'm, my mind, I was just thinking about Jesus being crucified and going, huh? Interesting. <laughs> like, I wonder if yeah. Sen was Seneca eating an apple? What, what was happening at the time? Right. Right. You know, that's a trip. Right. And, and I think of, you know, going back to your books and you write a lot about these mythological characters, these very real people, but have been obviously mythologic. Sorry, I'm not quite mythologized. sure. The, mythologized. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then I think of people nowadays and we mythologize them, but it's just not the same thing because of the amount of time hasn't passed, something like right. that. But you see somebody like a Kanye West, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't know what the future holds, like what the history books will tell of Kanye, whether or not it's going to be found that he had a tumor in his brain that made him a genius. And it was much like, you know, one of those movies where he's just like crazy, crazy genius, but has no fashion right. sense. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I love hearing about that. I mean, I'm a huge fan of his music. I mean, I actually like a lot of his songs. Right. It's just, it hits me in the right way. I know it doesn't hit everybody in the right way, but it's listening to like talking about Howard Hughes. I had no idea that, you know, he, he was lived a life the, in misery that you would sort of describe in the book, Ego is the Enemy. And um, the only movie I'd seen was The Aviator. 
So, right. of course, you know, that's all I really know. And I don't really remember all the little bits and pieces. Yeah, I think he peed in some jars. So we kind of well, tend to remember, you know, certain things about people and forget all the all the rest. Yeah, I think that's right. And and Kanye is so fascinating because he's extraordinarily talented and he, he does make amazing music. And so sometimes people try to use that as an excuse to justify his ego. So like I talk about him in the book because he's always the except like if you say ego is bad and it make it, it will hamper your success or hinder your success. People always go, well, what about Kanye? You know, like uh, yeah. and and what I think that misses is one. Um, if you've ever seen the sad Kanye meme on the Internet, he doesn't seem like a super happy person, but I he's not successful because he has an enormous ego. He's successful because he's extraordinarily talented and that talent was not given to him as a gift. He made it right. Like he's talented because he loves music. He's put in thousands of hours making it. He has brilliant taste and he's an astute marketer. His ego is the reason why middle America hates Kanye West, even though they should like him. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, his ego is the reason why he can't sit down in an award show and let someone else win. His ego is why he can't uh, not open his mouth and say, you know, why didn't you nominate me for all these awards? And he means that when he's saying it. He, I think he's gen – even though he's, he's sold millions and millions of records, he's rich, he's famous, you know, he's made great art. He's mad that this awards uh, organization has not given him his due and it it – it makes him miserable, right? So, so I think it's interesting. Do you really think that it's all ego and not partly media manipulation? I mean, it, it, or is it just a byproduct of his ego? Well, I think I, I, I do think at a certain point you realize that being a bit crazy and doing you know ridiculous things can can generate media attention. Um, but a guy like that, I don't think needs more media. I don't. I think at certain points, maybe in during launches, he might deliberately lean into it. But you know, a, a lot of these things were not in his interest, right? Doing the, interrupting Taylor Swift for the second time was not in his interest. Um, he can't help himself, and I don't think he can help himself from saying and doing all sorts of things. And so. Uh, that has been my experience with other people like that. So I'm not just writing about this as an outsider. I mean, I've, de I've, I've dealt with, with, with people who are in similar sort of levels of, of power and success. And it, it oftentimes they are their own worst enemy and everyone around them has, has begged them and, and t begged them not to do that and tried to show them why it's not in their interest and they just literally cannot help themselves. Yeah. I mean, I can, I, I even, I'm a very, very like Z level celebrity when it comes to that, but people still lie to me. They still tell me what I want to hear. They don't want to tell right. me bad news. Even people that I'm close to, uh, I've, I've found out or seen it and it's not done in a, in a bad way or, or to, to be deceptive. Right. Um, it's like, oh, they want to cushion me for, they don't want me don't want me to stress out so I could think, okay, it must be yes. like on a completely crazy level with some of these people like a Donald Trump, you know, you're going to get fired yeah. if you bring him the wrong tea, you know, so I can imagine. I think that's he, a great point. Yeah. So, I mean, people just tell you what you want to hear and it happens even on the tiniest levels because especially Americans are very passive aggressive, right? They don't want to say right. what they feel. They just want to do what they feel later. <laughs> I've I've never I've never done a talk and not had everyone come up to me after and say you did so great and and I know that not all of them were equally good you know what I mean <laughs> right. and and, and I, someone gave me a sign once because I, I talked about this before and they gave me a sign and, or a, a, they gave me this painting and the painting just says like everyone loved you and and it was only it what I realized is that so. And, and this is, uh, I guess, exposing myself a little bit. But a, a friend of mine gave a talk at, before me, and I went and I didn't, I couldn't watch it because I was like preparing for my speech. And and I saw them after, and I was like, "You were so great up there." And then I was like, "Wait, I didn't actually watch them. Like, I just lied to their face, right? For no for no reason other than I thought it would make them feel better." And then after after my talk, somebody said, "You did great." 
And I felt that, you know, that that gratification and validation you feel when someone tells you you did a great job. I felt that. And then I realized, you know, how ridiculous that is. It's like I just looked someone in the eye and told them they did great, even though I had no idea what I was talking about. And now someone looked me in the eye and told me I did great. And I'm taking that seriously. And so you have to learn that you really it, I think what why ego is so dangerous is that it deprives you of the ability to cultivate and seek out sort of objective feedback that makes you better. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned Tim Ferriss before, mm -hmm. and I was actually listening to his podcast with you leading up to this oh. one. Um, Cause folks, if you haven't listened to Tim Ferriss's podcast, it's, it's gold. I mean, it's great. It's I listened to, to not my episode, but a different episode on my drive this morning. Do you ever listen to yourself on programs? to see like what never. you sound like never what about I mean, do you books? listen to your own albums uh i listen to my own albums and i've confessed this before for research so sure i do it as work i don't do it okay like to like jam out or anything but although um, i've heard kanye west does that yeah i mean if it's a beat or something that makes you go uh i mean you're hearing <laughs> it a lot i get that uh <laughs> but yeah it's a, it's a weird thing like you definitely like to hear back or see back like when you get your your manuscript or your book yes. printed and sent to you in the mail, like it's cool to see, right? But you don't necessarily like read every page of, of the course. finished book. So it's like that with, with a record, like it's nice to have it done and to have it there. It's like a sense of satisfaction, right? Right. Um, but at the same time, yeah, it, it's, it's a research thing and listening back is painful at times, but I was let's go back to Tim Ferriss and, and sure. he, he was talking about canvassing and, and he played a section of your book. Uh, right. and it hit me just at the right time because I was like, I've, I've always had different interns for the studio here, but I wanted to have a less defined helper, so to speak. And when you started talking about canvassing and apprenticeship, it just like, I literally that, like as I was listening, got on my phone and started like talking about some ideas to a few of my guys here that work here. And like, I want to do this. I want to find a few people. And so like, I literally already found an apprentice and he's been helping me out. And, and it's a, such an easy job. Everybody's like, you just want to slave. And it's like, no, I just have him come over and we work on projects together and right. that's it. You know, it's for a couple hours and I like, send him texts and he sends me emails, right. you know, it's like that. It's like just having another person to bounce ideas off and to get a few things done and it could go anywhere from there. But I would love for you to sort of talk about canvassing, what it is, uh, what it sort of can be translated to in modern terms. Yeah. Well, I, I was talking, I'm, I'm talking about, um, how you attach yourself to someone who knows, a lot more than you and you absorb all of that knowledge and and you make yourself indispensable to them by by providing a lot of value and oftentimes you're not getting paid for this so there was like a, a controversy a couple years ago where sheryl sandberg who's the ceo of she's a billionaire she posted this job posting uh, for her Lean In Foundation. It was like an unpaid internship. And a bunch of websites like Gawker got really upset and they said, how could you, how could this billionaire be, you know, posting an unpaid internship? And that it's, so, that it's so exploitative. And I remember thinking, well, what is like an hour of Sheryl Sandberg's time worth? Probably like $100,000, like an absurd amount of money, right? Um, if you could ever, like, if you could, what could you buy an hour of her time for it. You probably couldn't. So here, this person gets to work with her 40 hours a week, and they're mad that they're not getting paid $9 an hour. You know, like, um, it, it's a priceless experience. And so me personally, I was an apprentice. I was exactly the thing you're just talking about looking for, for an author named Robert Green, who wrote The 48 Laws of Power and a book called Mastery. Um, and, and a bunch of other huge bestsellers. And my job was to basically do all the things that he didn't want to do for his books that would be helpful to him. So he could he could focus on the essential tasks. And in exchange, he paid me a little bit of money and he would answer my questions when I had them. And so this was a four or five year experience where he taught me everything that I needed to know to eventually 
become an author myself. And hopefully whoever is working for you could one day run their own studio or when they, you know, they could meet the right person and they're starting their own band. They're so they're learning the, the base of knowledge that really you couldn't get anywhere else. What kind of college can you go to right now and get that class? Is there a class? Is there is there a spot? No. To become and, an author? Or? Right. And and what would it cost if you could get a degree? You know, the average student loan debt is, you know, sometimes in the six figures for people. So it's like you're you're doing you're not like I was like I saw it as not only do I get to work for Robert Greene, he's teaching me stuff and it's free. He's paying me like this is absurd. I felt so lucky. That is absurd. I mean, I would do that. I, I feel like I do still do that. Actually, I was just down down doing songwriting with, with John Feldman, and he's a hugely successful songwriter, producer, performer. Mm-hmm. Um, and we play music together. Of course, we're colleagues or you know peers, but I still look up to him in, in the fact that he's doing what I do, but like on a completely different level and a different genre. And yeah, and I got the podcasting game locked down, you know, over John, but, but, you know, so I go, <laughs> I go and just hang out at his house for a couple of days and we write. And when he's busy doing stuff, getting coffee, I write on my own and I do my own and I focus on, on just doing more of, of what we're already doing, but in that mindset, in that environment. And it's a little different because I'm not having to like go run and get him coffee or do any like tasks, but I'm not getting paid. I'm, you know, so it's like, it's like I'm there spending my time to learn and to do cool things. I mean, it's so valuable to me. Well, I I think that's the thing that people miss and and what's so dangerous about ego. I think we all accept that when we're just starting out, we have to, we have to do something like that. But then we think at a certain point we arrive and then we no longer have to learn because we know everything that there is. That's the most dangerous idea. Um, you know, you've been doing this for two and a half decades. Uh, the idea that you would still be attaching yourself to someone who you think knows more than you and willing to put in time, unpaid time to learn, to get better at what you do. That is the mark of someone who is dedicated to their craft. There's this quote from Emerson that I have in the ego book where he's saying, you know, every man that I meet is in some way my superior. And in that I will learn from him. And I think that's what you want to do. You have to, it's, hey, it's not, hey, I made it. I signed a label deal or I sold my first book or I, you know, I created my first company. Therefore, now I'm the master and I know everything. It's no, now, now that I've achieved this level of success and if I want to get to the next level, I have to, I have to meet and cultivate a relationship with someone who's already there and, and get as much as I can from them in exchange for whatever I have to give them. I've definitely been sort of just practicing, always trying to learn, always trying to pay attention. And uh, it's gotten it's gotten a little bit easier over the years, at the same time harder as I get older, right? But you were talking a lot in the book, and I love the Kirk, Kirk Hammett story. Um, oh, yeah. It's great. And it's exactly what we're talking about here. So you guys check out Ego is the Enemy. You won't be disappointed. It's great. Um, yeah, I want to talk about you know, Bill Belichick, all that, you know, just doing the jobs that no one loves to do, finding what it is about your job that everyone else hates. Right. That, that's something that really can, I think can help you. It kind of goes back to like, I was, I was, uh, I had like a challenge all of June, a couple of years ago, I would go and d- jump into the Puget Sound, Sinclair, oh, okay. Sinclair Inlet. And the water is about 52 degrees average, uh, pretty cold in general, not complete. I mean, you're not going to freeze to death unless you stay in there for a while. But for me, I'm a wuss. It is cold. Right. But I did it for a (laughs) month straight just as like, I'm going to do this. And the whole idea was this is the worst thing that's going to happen to you, hopefully all day. (laughs) And so like, it just kind of like change, you know, just it's a, it's something to do to change your routine, change your systems. And yeah, uh, a lot of what you write about and a lot of the people that you write about definitely have systems. They have something a little, a little, uh, I guess a little off center of what you would think is what you need to work on. And whether it's discipline, whether it's tying your shoes the right way on the football field. Right. Right. I mean, is there anything that you learned 
that you do writing or that you focus on that isn't obvious to other people? Maybe they're missing the boat on this. I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll give you. I'll, I'll give you one thing to go back to sort of what you're saying about finding the things that people don't want to do. I get I'll, since I've written about this stuff and and I have my my own company. I'll, I'll get emails from kids and they'll say like, "I want to work for you. I'll do anything. Like I'll do any kind of job. Not like they'll do anything, but I'll do yeah. any kind of job." And 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 one of the things I I've sort of realized that they're missing and is that me coming up with a job for them is inherently costly to me. Like I have to think about it. And when I think about how I got my break, uh, it was for a different author, but I saw, like I was a big fan of his website and I saw that he wasn't doing this thing uh, about, it was called, uh, Amazon has this affiliate program and if you put links to stuff, you get revenue when you make sales. And, I, and so I said, hey, uh, I'm a huge fan of your work. Um, I noticed you're not doing this I know how to do that. Could I do that for you? And I don't want to get paid. I just want to do that for you. And and he was like, yeah, sure. I don't I don't care. Like, it, you know, it was all upside for him. So I did that. And that's how we sort of struck up a working relationship. And so I think, you know, it's like, hey, I'll be your slave is not a super attractive offer. <laughs> you want to be able to say, hey, I know how to do this. I'd like to help you with that thing. So I've always thought when I approach really busy people, I'm trying to offer them something specific or tangible, and that's what we're connecting over, not the fact that I'm begging them and w and claiming that I'm willing to submit to anything and everything. Right, of course. It, it's mutually beneficial. I mean, I, right. I, I feel like I learned so much. That's how I learned to record, was asking Jerry Finn questions asking uh, Dave Jordan questions. If you look up there, there's, you know, producers, but uh, guys that have been doing records after records and they have stories and they, you know, it, it was fun recording with Dave Jordan, not just because he knew how to record and knew how to produce. It was, it was the patina that he brought. It was, wow. I'm, you know, I have, check out this knife. Yeah. Um, Keith gave me this knife, you know, from the Rolling Stones. He, he says, wow. Keith gave me this knife. And, <laughs> <laughs> and he would just tell stories about how they would just fight with each other and he would always be in between. And Keith would say, oh, you're not one of his guys, you know, like be my guy. So, you know, just fun stuff that you just hear yeah. about, about other bands and about legendary rock sessions and whether it's, uh, a haunted studio up in at Robert Lang Studios in Seattle, Washington, where we're, we're hearing about the screaming trees doing a seance in the control room. And all the while, you know, the producer's telling us about this and he's like, you know, saying the ashtray was right there. And we're all, you know, we were kids at the time looking at the island. The island is, is a, a rack. Basically, it's like a kitchen island, but with musicals, recording okay. gear in it. But everything's always up there so that they had this big ashtray and it started spinning around and it flew off the island and smashed into a thousand i mean it was just like spinning stories and and we grew up in an era where we made records you know months at a time in one spot and we would camp out and you had this sort of i don't know this all these different stories you would hear and there was like i said patina to kind of everything we we came in contact with back in those days nowadays it's just i mean times change but sure uh, hearing those stories really is probably a huge part of how we made those records and why they're so memorable for us and it would be impossible to put a value on what that's worth do you know what i mean like the, the edu your education in in the art or the profession that you pursue is priceless and so you but the problem is that ego gets in the way of that. It thinks like, oh, I've got to do my own thing now, or I know more than this person, or, you know, it's, there's a quote from Epictetus that I love where he says, you know, one cannot learn that which they think they already know. And I'm sure you've dealt with a lot of young people and, you know, not young people who are repulse people around them with their sense of certainty and mastery of every single thing. And, and maybe they're, maybe they really are pretty good, but that doesn't mean that there isn't more that they could learn. 
Yeah, what, what is it that goes through somebody's mind that makes them get a tattoo of Super Bowl champs and their team logo before the game has been played? Like, you see that every year, right? Yeah. It's things like that where you're just like, they're so sure. And it just always reminds me of Homer. I think it's Homer in the Iliad where he's, I could be wrong on the name, but he falls asleep and because he sees, oh, we're almost home. So he falls asleep right. and the winds blow him away or whatever. So I always am thinking that whenever I'm like close to completing something. And I always think of that when I fuck up playing tennis. Like we've, we've done this epic battle back and forth and I'm just running to catch every ball and then finally I just it's an easy shot that you miss and you're just like I had it all but the, right. the easiest shot I missed so I mean there's like these little microcosms of of these ideas everywhere in life if we just pay attention like like yeah um, like Paulo Coelho, Coelho would say you know look for the omens sure uh, there's a quote I have from Marina Abranovic, who's a, a brilliant artist, and she's saying, you know, when you, it, it's when you start to believe in your own greatness, that's the death of your creativity. And it's it's like the second you start to think you have it, that's when you make some boneheaded mistake. That's when you piss off the wrong person. You know, that's when you that's when you do the wrong thing. And and so I I, I guess what I'm saying is, um, it's it, it's it's far better to to sort of put that ego aside and to be continually a student and continually willing to learn and and continually aware that you can do better that prevents those sort of things from happening as much as you know it's possible to do that yeah absolutely i mean i think all these things are really great reminders it's things that you sort of you've heard whisperings of throughout your life yeah 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 fast food's bad for you you know that kind of smoking's bad you know like it's like right. things that are good for you like pay attention people you know and we just need those reminders a lot of times, definitely. And and I'm continually reminded that you cannot coast. I mean, in, in the business that I'm in, being my my own boss, um, choosing where I spend my time and my money to invest, you know, I got to think about it in, in a lot of different ways. But, I mean, we're coming back to Austin, or, or sorry, to San Antonio. You're from yeah. Austin. Um, you know, it's such a great city. So it's like, okay, well, I have experience there and the experience is great. Let's keep coming back. We're going to be back in October 1st. So come on out. I, Do I it. have it in my calendar. Okay, right on, right on. The last time, you know, you came out, it was awesome. It was before, it was, had we done the podcast? I don't know. I guess we had I done think, the podcast. I think so. Yeah, we had. Yeah, because it was in January. So but let me ask you something. Let yeah. me ask you something. So, so you have that show, and you know that the last time it, you know, it was good, and you sold X amount of tickets, and blah blah blah. I think what what often happens is people, and not, I'm not saying you're doing it, but I'm wondering how you deal with it. You can tell yourself a story that, like, hey, my last book was successful, so this one is obviously going to be successful, and you don't think about. Okay, why was I successful? Is it because I did this kind of marketing? You know, was it that I picked the right venue? Was it the right time? It's like if you take for granted that you, since you were successful last time, that it's that it was great last time, that it's automatically going to be great the next time. That's when uh, probably I would imagine you show up and there's no fans, right? Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. It's a good point, and I'm constantly dealing with that as most people probably are, but there's all these factors that you just mentioned, and there's a bunch more that I don't even probably know about. Um, there's, there's a lot of people involved, even in a DIY type scenario, a band like us that has a small yet very powerful team of people um, just constantly grinding, constantly working, and never getting it done. And we have a, a few more minutes. We have an about 10 minutes, I really okay. wanted to get into this aspect that you're talking about being overly busy, being too busy yeah. to really just, uh, you at a point in your life, almost, you know, had a breakdown, uh, maybe talk a little bit about that. What, some of the things you did because me, and then I'll let you talk. Yeah. People constantly come up to me and say, man, you know, they ask, how you doing? I'm, I'm great. I'm great. They're like, oh, you, you look really busy. They constantly say you're <laughs> busy, busy, busy. And I'm like, well, in some ways, yes, I'm busy, but in the way they're thinking, I don't think I'm as busy as they think I am. I mean, I, I definitely am constantly doing something, 
But sometimes sure. it's just sitting on a couch talking. Sometimes sure. it's sitting on the back steps uh, making a, you know, promo for my podcast. You know, it's like right. all these different things put into your day. Um, I think that's a big issue today, and it's it's not getting better. It's probably getting worse. So this book comes at a great time for me to sort of go, okay, what are some things I can do to continually not be overly busy? Well, I think I think for the most part, you know, you seem like a hustler, and and I'm I, I I'm big on hustle and and sort of initiative and trying to I like I'm sort of self-taught and, and, you know, I've built my own business and my own career. And so like what that requires is sort of always saying yes, always being on, being willing to jump on opportunities, make stuff. But the problem is if that is not, if that's not contained in some sort of discipline or boundaries is that it just takes over your life, you know? And so for me, I sort of got to a point where it was like, I realized that I'd, I'd basically said yes to everything I'd ever been offered. And uh, I'd never said no to anything or stopped doing any of the things that I'd said yes to. So it was like my my life was just getting it was like a balloon. It was just stretching thinner and thinner and thinner. And eventually it sort of popped. And and so I've had to realize that one. I mean, one of the ways that ego is is so dangerous is that it tells you you're capable of more than you're actually capable of. And it makes you insecure and you feel like if you say no, you'll never get another opportunity. And so I sort of had to learn that I, I have to get this stuff under control. I have to be disciplined and I have to know why I'm doing each thing. And, I, you know, you have to ask yourself, hey, what am I doing any of this stuff for? Like, am I trying, you know, that per personal happiness and contentment and peace is ultimately the the reward of working hard. And so if you don't get that, you're sort of just on this treadmill. And so my, my breakdown was related to that. Just, just over commitment at beyond whatever I was sort of physically and emotionally and personally capable of. Man, that is, it's tough. Um, yeah. I think, I think a lot of people feel bad saying no, they feel guilty. Yeah. They, they, they feel like they have to lie. And honestly, it's affected some relationships um, in a negative way. But at the end of the day, you go, you know what? I just can't say yes to everything. So if that's going right. to affect our relationship, well, I guess that's going to have to be the decision made. But um, it's uh, – <laughs> yeah, we're talking. It's, be it's, better, it's better to say no and be honest than to say yes and then drop the ball. You, it's like your reputation is what matters more than anything. And I, I sort of realized it was like, okay, wait, like, you know, I had this book that I have to deliver to a publisher. If I say yes to all the, you know, hey, do I want to go do this? And hey, do I want to, you know, come meet this person for dinner? And, you know, do I want to hop on the phone with this total stranger? Um, those might be nice and they might be decently beneficial. But if my, if the work that I make my living on suffers, then I'm being really stupid. And, and I'm sure you see, it's like, you can, you can have all these other projects and you can run your own business and you can be, you can be marketing. But at the end of the day, if the music suffers, all of it is pointless. Yeah. Yeah. Plus you pursued music because you love music and it's what makes you happy. And that's how it is for me with writing. It's like, wait, like I, I'm, I'm waking up and rushing, you know, from here or there and I'm constantly busy and I'm not, I'm losing my favorite thing, which is sitting down in a quiet room and writing. And so what is the point of that? Some tasty morsels, Ryan, Ryan holiday, <laughs> everybody. Yeah. I love it, man. I mean, this is all stuff that I've been getting so into. Um, I only, I, I literally wish I had even more time to sort of take it all in and, and read all everything. I, I think I will eventually, um, but I'm putting it into practice. Like maybe a cha maybe it's a chapter is all you need. And then you just try that like canvassing. Obviously I put it into real practice literally the day I've found out about it. So <laughs> it's kind of like, yeah, you're right. I guess I am a hustler, but, uh, <laughs> well, I, I try to, I try to think about my books, probably not dissimilarly to how you think about music in that I want every chapter to be a standalone. And so if that's, if you know, you just leave with one song or one single, that's great, but they do work in concert. But I feel like people write these big, complicated books and they forget that audiences are busy and maybe people don't have 
a week and a half to read a whole book. So I tr I've tried to make it in in pieces for that reason. Yeah, I think that's definitely something to that that makes sense for the way we live nowadays. Um, using things like audiobooks to the real book. Like I, I literally have Ego is the Enemy on audiobook, and I've been listening to that, and I have the book in front of me. So it's like. If I need to like go and go, what what did he say? Like, what was that? There was like, you're talking about golden means or golden me meme? I, I was thinking no, you said- No, mean. Me golden mean, like an average. Mean means average. Okay, I see. Not academic over here. So I was thinking you you were talking about memes. I knew that's not what you actually meant. I wish. But I, I, I was like, golden meme. That makes so much sense because right. memes are kind of like these these little like tokens of truth or- you yeah, know, yeah. Today. No, that that's one of my favorite things. Yeah, he's basically saying, and that's an interesting concept that like every every virtue is a midpoint between two vices. So like he's saying, bravery is in between courage, or bravery is in between recklessness and cowardice, mm. and so it's the average of those things. And we live in a world that's so polar. So totally left and right up and down black and well we don't live in a black and white world um sorry i had to decline that phone call <laughs> you back yeah 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 that's the thing with skype if somebody calls in it does not oh really yeah it just comes in um yeah man the so golden mean that makes yes. a lot more sense i'm <laughs> glad you explained that i was thinking golden meme I guess I have to fix my pronunciations. No, I think it's just a tough. It's so close. It's so close. And um, you know, we think if you if you said emoji, I would know exactly what you meant. Right. Is there an emoji for emoji? Uh, I think so. It's whatever the thing is on your screen, right? Yeah, but that's uh, that's yeah. that is an emoji. But is there an emoji to describe an emoji? <laughs> I'm getting. No. A little meta yeah probably not because i don't know what it would be um dead times now yeah we all deal with that maybe not quite in in the way like a prisoner in prison would but you know what can we be doing at a job we hate we have a few minutes we can we can cover this yeah so i i tried i I, this is advice actually I got from Robert Green when I was his apprentice. I was you know, sort of thinking about starting writing my first book, but I had a job. And he basically said, you know, you can decide whether this is dead time or alive time. Are you going to take advantage of this time when you have a, a day job and, you know, use it to fund your creative activity? Or are you going to wait until your job ends and then on that first day, you know, start your book? And it's the same thing. It's like, hey, yeah. we're supposed to do this call at a certain time. And maybe you text me right before and you say, hey, I'm going to be 20 minutes late. It's like, what am I going to choose to do with that 20 minutes? Am I going to be like, oh, that sucks. I'm so mad. It's rude, you know, and uh, complain and then turn on the TV. Or am I going to pick up a book or call someone that I need to talk to? Or maybe I'm going to work for 20 minutes. You know, it's, yeah. it's sort of, what are you going to do with the, the extra time that you have in life and how are you going to make the most of it get out there and do it thank you so much for being on ryan i appreciate it ryan holiday everybody the my career hour adobe radio tune in next week new episodes always every friday one more time i want to thank ryan holiday for being on thank you so much for your time sir and lootcrate.com make sure you guys go to the website check out the crates that they have the themes that they have this month it's futuristic so go to lootcrate.com forward slash mike and then enter code M-I-K-E for $3 off your subscription. All right, I'll see you guys on the interwebs. Mike Herrera TD. If you want to write me, MikeHerrera.net for the show notes. You know what to do.